Uh, so uh, Dr. Jacobs uh, is a New York-based scholar and author. She's an archaeologist by training. She earned her PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology and Anthropology from the University of Oregon and spent many years working on archaeological excavations and economic development projects in the Middle East. She is Director Emerita of Jacobs Engineering Group, a global engineering construction firm that had been involved in development work in the Middle East for 30 years. She is a past president of Middle East Technology Assistance, member of the board of directors of Near East uh, Foundation, founder of the uh, Violet Jbara Charitable Trust, which is dedicated to improving the lives of people in developing countries in the Middle East, and to fostering greater understanding of Middle Eastern culture in the United States. She also sits on the board of the Moise Khairallah Center and also the American University of Beirut. Uh, Emerita on an AUB. All right, so Emerita. <laughs> in 2011, she founded Kalima Press, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Arabic, Kalima means word. Uh, Kalima Press, she is the author of a memoir of her three years in Iran, Digging In, an American archaeological archaeologist uncovers the path of the real Iran, and a series of articles about the 19th century Syrian colony in New York. Uh, in 2013, she was part of a project called Little Syria, Lower Manhattan, before the World Trade Center. Her most recent publication is Strangers in the West, the Syrian colony of New York City from 1880 to 1900. All four of her grandparents were members of the New York Syrian colony. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacobs. Thank you. So um, this is technology that I'm not sure I understand, and I'm actually standing right in front of the screen, right? So I'll try not to do that. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Akram, and your team for having me here. It's really wonderful to be in this beautiful place. I think um, Rolly is just gorgeous, really gorgeous. Um, it's, and it's wonderful that the Kharala Center is um, doing this work on Lebanese diaspora studies because uh, we are the forgotten, definitely the forgotten. And so it's fantastic that there's an institute, a center um, dedicated to this work. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, historians of the Syrian diaspora in the United States credit the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876 with jump-starting Syrian immigration to the United States. It did not. It was, however, the first of more than a dozen, and in fact, I've now counted about 18, American fairs in which Syrians participated, and their cumulative impact was indeed important. Americans had fair fever at the end of the 19th century, and Syrians caught the disease. The list of fairs with Syrian participation is large, but the number of fairs that actually took place is much larger. Ah, see, it does go backwards. Now, let's see. Hey, why don't we do the arrows for you? Okay. I'll, I'll just be your remote. You'll be my remote. Okay. Yeah, so you tell me when you want to go, go back one. Yes, ma'am. Please. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I'm not going to touch this, actually. Okay. Um, the, fairs had, the fairs as a group had two main impacts on Syrian immigration to this country. I'm sorry, I'm standing in front of you. Um, they attracted Syrians who might not have otherwise come to the United States, and they promoted Syrian commercial interests in the United States by putting Syrian merchants and goods in front of large numbers of potential and actual customers. More than 50 million, 55 million people attended one or more fairs when the population of the United States was a total of 65 million. But the fair experience was not one of an unalloyed success. For one thing, almost none of the fairs made money or ended up in the black. Investors and participants usually lost money, yet they continued to stage the fairs. Syrian merchants themselves spent a, expended a substantial amount of money to transport goods to the fair, to buy the stock, to pay duty, to travel to the venue, to pay rent and the other fees that were required by the fair organizers, and to live far from home for the duration of the fair. They did not often make a profit and sometimes ended up in debt, even if the fair as a whole was successful. Syrians who worked for others at the fair were at the mercy of, the other, of their employers' fortunes, and if the, the venture failed, the, the employees usually suffered more than the employer. And even if the merchant came away with a profit, the fair was by definition temporary, and so the profit was not, the money uh, earned was not sustainable. 
And by definition, fairs were outside time and outside reality. So they did not necessarily impart lessons that could be used in the world. Although presented as high-toned, elevating experiences, the true purpose of the fairs was evident to everyone. They promoted the commercial interests of the host city and the participating companies. This purpose never changed. What did change was the increasingly explicit emphasis on commercialism and entertainment, which livened them up or cheapened them depending on your point of view. Under the guise of the new, and I use air quotes here, science of eugenics and race hierarchy, organizers added ethnographic exhibits from other countries as well as our own, because there were Native American exhibits as well, um, including the display of living people, privileging the exotic and the primitive. The three strands, amusement park fun, commerce, and the exotic, meshed in the oriental villages at every fair, and Syrians became expert and sophisticated exploiters of these, of these opportunities. Okay, let us begin where every historian begins, and that's with the Centennial Fair of 1876 in Philadelphia. I'm not gonna give you backgrounds on these fairs because they're all on Wikipedia. You can find them very easily. Um, three, that opened in 1876 in Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. Three countries, Turkey, Egypt, and Tunis, represented the Middle East. Nobody called Turkey at that time. In, the, in America, nobody called Turkey the Ottoman Empire. So just think of it as Turkey, although it, was, it represented all of the Ottoman Empire. The exposition, as its name suggests, exposed a large swath of the American public. Nearly 10 million people attended the 1876 fair to the people and wares of the Middle East for the first time. This may have been the first display of belly dancing in the United States as well, as there were three male musicians and two female dancers that performed in the Turkish theater. But no one remarked on it, either in the fair documents or in the newspapers, so it's not clear what the, the women were doing or what the men were doing. It's also not clear how many of the exhibitors at the Centennial Fair were Syrian. In fact, none of the names that are listed in the official catalogs are Arab names at all. They are uh, Turkish names, but mostly European names. Um, the official catalog states that 1,632 exhibitors showed goods in the Turkey Pavilion, a number surpassed only by the United States and England. This is difficult to credit, both because the Turkish exhibition was very small in the exhibit hall, and because the description of the Turkish exhibit was about a tenth of the size of the description of the Egyptian exhibit. So it's very hard to imagine that there were almost 2,000 exhibitors at the Turkish exhibit, but that is what the official catalog said. They, uh, the majority of the exhibit w showed luxury textiles, which won a number of awards, medals, but also included Turkish tobacco, damascened weapons, and bottles of attar of roses, which they say was um, sold. At, it, it, uh, the weight of attar of roses was exactly the same um, value as gold at that fair. And many of the items on display, even though it was meant to be a patriotic display of uh, products from the Ottoman Empire, many of the items were for sale. Uh, Adele Yunus mentions in her book that many of the goods were from Aleppo, Damascus, and Beirut, implying that the, that the merchants, whether or not they were at the fair, were Syrian. But we don't know that for a fact. But scattered around the fairgrounds of the Centennial Fair were Turkish, Algerian, Tunisian, and Palestine bazaars. These booths were set up by foreign merchants, and they were not government-supported. They were set up by entrepreneurs. Th uh, their location outside the main buildings presaged the practice um, brought to its apotheosis at the Chicago Fair of 1893 of separating the entertainment section of the fair from the educational section of the fair, a, a distinction that was completely and utterly uh, worthless and meaningless but they continued to do it to try to preserve the high-mindedness of the fairs. 
Although the bazaars were given almost no coverage in the official documents, these were apparently so popular that Americans started setting up booths all over the fairgrounds and having um, things, to what they call in the, um, in the newspapers, quote, trinkets from the Orient being made by the bushel in West Philadelphia. So they were selling a very early example of Americans co-opting um, Arab Orientalist objects and selling them at this fair. Okay, next slide, thank you. We know that a Syrian company called Nahli and Brothers, Jerusalem, erected the Palestine Bazaar. The brothers Nahli, Abraham, Jacob, and Jean Abdel Nur uh, Kurt, um, and a man named David Jamal, five Syrians, came from Jerusalem and landed in um, Philadelphia on April 3rd, 1876. Four months later, they filed their intention papers for naturalizations. This is three of them. This is David Jamal on the left, Abraham Abdel Nur Kurt on the bottom, and Nahli, whose name is on the Palestine Bazaar, on the top, on the, the right. Next slide, please. This is the only photograph I've ever found of the Palestine Bazaar. No one took pictures of these bazaars because they were kind of informal. But you can see that they probably rented space from the Brazil Cafe. And uh, it says uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Palestine. Uh, the five Syrians dressed, quote, in the peculiar costume of their country, unquote, sold only one line of products, olive wood, crucifixes, rosaries, card and cigar cases, matchboxes, and gigaws, all made, said the Syrians, of wood from those spots in the Holy Land which are so dear to Christians. Since Nahli went on to become a cabinet maker in Boston and then New York, he may have been the carver of these objects. One reporter had apparently spent time in Palestine because he attested to the genuine quality of the goods in contrast to the cheap, uh, quote, cheap jewelry manufactured in Paris that was for sale in the Tunisian bazaar nearby. And when asked about their faith, the reporter asked them about their faith, they said, apparently in unison, Christians, we are Orthodox, every one of us. Unfortunately, in this picture, the men were moving when it was taken, and so even when you zoom in, you cannot see their faces or what they're wearing. But a question that comes to my mind is whether they dressed up for the fair or whether they were wearing what they wore at home. We don't know. In spite of the tiny number of Syrians at the fair, Eunice claimed that it was here that, quote, Syrian entrepreneurs discovered new markets, giving Syrian emigration a new impetus. It is true that trade in Holy Land goods was a point of entry for many peddlers and early, near early Syrian entrepreneurs who discovered very quickly that Holy Land goods could be uh, manufactured in New York City. But did the idea come from the fair? Were the prizes awarded to the Turkish goods a signal that there was a large market for these fancy goods in the United States? It's hard to make this case for the Centennial Fair because it's hard to see how this was communicated back to potential entrepreneurs in Syria. But as we will see as the fairs accumulate, the case gets stronger. I want to interject a little no, date, tie, date note here because it's, it's in, so this fair was in 1876. In 1878, the first Syrian immigrant family arrived in the United States. So two years after the fair was over. And on their way from Beirut, they stopped at the Exposition Universelle in Paris. So they were, they were very early fairgoers as well. Okay. The world's uh, industrial and cotton centennial exhibition was scheduled to open in New Orleans in December of 1884. John Abdel Noor, who had been in America since 1880, went to New Orleans a full year in advance, that is in 1883, and told the managers that he and his, some of his countrymen would be making a fine display of Turkish and Syrian goods, including textiles, jewelry, inlaid furniture, rugs, wines, and tobacco, an array not dissimilar from the things that won prizes at the Centennial Fair. This was the first time those luxury Turkish goods were in the hands of independent entrepreneurs rather than in the hands of the state government. 
traders who represented the state government. And you will note the eight-year gap between 1884, which is the New Orleans Fair, and 1876, the Centennial Fair, in which no, and there were fairs that went on during that time, but no Syrians participated, which kind of bolsters my argument, I think, to, to, um, that the, the Centennial Fair did not really spur Syrian immigration or even Syrian participation in fairs, but rather it was the Arbelis coming in 1878 and then the beginning of real Syrian immigration in 1880, which allowed the Syrians to participate uh, regularly in these fairs. Okay. The gigantic Southern Exposition that opened in Louisville in the fall of 1883 was 100 days long the first year. It had three subsequent shorter seasons in 1884, 1885, and 1887. The main exposition building, which you see here, had 13 acres under one roof, and Thomas Edison himself came down to Louisville to install 1,800 of his newly invented incandescent light bulbs. It was the first fair to be open at night. The, a million visitors attended the first year. And among those visitors was the Arbeely family, the first Syrian immigrant family. They went to Louisville for the fair. And the Arbeelys began um, to, they, they lectured in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky on the Holy Land and on Palestine. So it was something that they had been doing since 1881, but they came down for the fair and then um, entertained in, in Louisville and Lexington. In, in 1885, there was a single Syrian that we know of selling Holy Land goods in Louisville, but no other Middle Eastern presence is recorded. The third season, however, in 1885, saw the presence of four Syrian entrepreneurs. John Abdel Noor, who we saw was in New Orleans, Fadis Ferzan, Abraham Sa Samaha, and A.F. Katani. Probably the same foursome who brought goods to New Orleans, although we don't have their names recorded for New Orleans. The reason we know their names, and this is so typical and so lovely, I think, is that they, called a, they, they organized a picnic on the fairgrounds behind the roller coaster. The roller coaster is not in this picture because it wasn't invented until 1885. Um, but it was the first appearance of a roller coaster um, at this fair. And they, so they arranged a picnic uh, on the fairgrounds, and they invited an American reporter to come. So he, the, and John Abdel Noor, as, as he always did when a reporter was in his sight, he gave a long, uh, in, a long speech about Syrian customs, the perfidy of the Mohammedans, the... Um, exotic way that the Syrians lived and he knew that it was a really good way to attract attention both to himself and his and his countrymen and to his goods which he wanted to sell. All, had, all of four men had immigrated to the United States years before. Abdul Noor from Damascus, Ferzan from Zouk Mikel, Samaha from Beirut and Katani I think from Zahli although I'm not sure. And they were the first Syrians already living in the United States to participate in an American fair. All of the early Syrians knew that exoticism is what sold goods. And when you could overlay the sanctity of the Christian religion and the Holy Land, that's, that was even better. The reporter reckoned Abdul Noor, quote, a very cultivated man, deeply read in history and literature, and speaking several languages fluently. In addition to selling goods at this fair, Abdul Noor had another agenda, which was that he was an expert in silk cultivation. He had apparently managed the plantations of the Sursuk family in Beirut. And he wanted to bring the most up-to-date silk cultivation technology to the United States, as well as set up direct importing of raw silk to the United States. He had already, in 1882, been in California to visit the recently established Silk Culture Association, which was, interestingly enough, a women's association um, set up in California in 1882. Um, but he found their techniques primitive and inefficient, and he thought that he could teach them something about silk cultivation. So at this fair, he set out to demonstrate a modern silkworm factory farm with a model representing 15,000 mulberry trees and 5 million worms. 
presumably as an advertisement to promote his importing aspirations. He was on his way to a meeting with the Secretary of State of the United States to promote his scheme. And I also should add that while in Louisville, Abraham Samaha, one of the four men, fell in love with a, an American um, teacher and married her and stayed in Louisville, maybe showing goods at the 1887 fair because they had their first child who died in infancy in Louisville in 1887. Okay, the, the third person in the foursome was Fadis Ferzan. This is not him, unfortunately. This is just a picture. But what he did was he set, I'll show you a picture of him in a, min, in a minute. What he did in, at the fair was set up a booth called the Pride of Damascus. And he set up a loom, uh, which he demonstrated, and, then, and he sold Turkish luxury textiles. And he delivered a set speech. And you can read this speech in newspaper accounts all over the country through the next two decades. It's the same speech, word for word. The looms, the dyes, the designs, the methods, the materials have all descended unaltered, unchanged from father to son for hundreds of years. The loom, he claimed, had never been before been seen outside of Damascus. He showed the reporter a textile for which he had, quote, refused $750, unquote. Sometimes he says $1,500, sometimes he says, you know, but... You get the idea. It's, it's so precious that he refused $750. And he showed them an Arabian carpet, 600 years old. Unlikely, very unlikely. He came well supplied with business cards that read Ferris A. Ferzan, Zouk Mikhail, Mount Lebanon, Syria. Okay. <clears throat> Ferzan made a living. This is like my favorite slide in the whole show because I love this guy. Ferzan made a living on the fair circuit. He went from, do you want to come up and sit? There are lots of chairs. Go ahead, come ahead. Please. Sorry, I'm, I left a mess here, but. Great, thanks. He made a living on the fair circuit, setting up Pride of Damascus booths wherever he went, complete with native costume, loom, speech, and goods for sale. When no fair was in the offing, he opened pop-up shops selling Turkish fancy goods in various cities. In 1886 alone, after Louisville closed, he set up shop in Kansas City, where he gave the same interview to, report, to a reporter he had given in New Orleans and Louisville, and handed out his card. He went to the Industrial Exposition in Minneapolis, participated in the Cincinnati Industrial Exposition, and then set up a stall inside Watson's department store in Cincinnati before leaving for Jacksonville, Florida. He traveled more than 2,000 miles in 1886, going from fair to fair. When he got to Jacksonville, he and his recently um, arrived brother Elias opened a Turkish fancy goods store in Jacksonville. And in April of 1887, he wrote to a group of um, uh, men in Pittsburgh who were planning an exposition in Sp Pittsburgh, asking them to reserve a space for him and his loom. It's not clear whether he went to that, but he did open a pop-up shop in Atlanta soon after. And at some point along the way, maybe in the same year, maybe about 1887, he sold a splendid woolen Syrian coat to the Smithsonian Institution. It has never been on display and retains its brilliant color to this day. So here he is modeling the coat, front and back. He's splendid, isn't he? He's got a great face, great mustache. Um, the, the rifle and the dagger and the sword are all possessions of the Smithsonian that were given to them by, um, they're all Ottoman, so they're um, genuine. And that's, I took that picture of the coat. It's just, I think, just gorgeous. Abraham Samaha and his wife that he had married in Louisville joined the Farazan brothers in Jacksonville, Florida, and he also opened a Turkish goods store. Next, please. In 1889, the four moved to the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The Farazan's opening, you know, we don't have a picture of it, but I'm just giving you a sense of the boardwalk. The Farazan's opening Farazan's Bazaar, Turkish goods, and Samaha selling Egyptian curios. 
the carnival atmosphere of the boardwalk was not much different than the fairs. And Jerusati Brothers actually is a um, Syrian firm, and the Jerusati Brothers did also, they were also fair participants, and they went from place to place. And this is where they ended up on the boardwalk as well. Um, leaving their shops in Atlantic City in other people's hands, Feris Ferzan and Abraham Samaha um, exhibited in the Pittsburgh exhibition of 1892 and then went on to the Chicago Fair. Next one. And a couple of years later, I don't know if this is clear or not, but this is my terrible photograph of Samaha's collection of Egyptian jewelry, which he sold to the Smithsonian. And, yeah, I mean, it's great. It's just great. Okay, so... John Abdel Noor, the um, fourth the sort of spokesman of the team, could I have the next slide? Yeah, um, took a different path than the, the others. Rather than going from fair to fair, he went right back after Louisville to New York, set up a Turkish goods importing business. He claimed that his store was the oldest, oldest Syrian store in the United States, 1885. And he remained... Um, in New York for the rest of his life, pretty much. He, it's not that he was a model of stability. He, had a, he entered into and dissolved more than a dozen partnerships in his lifetime. He had a very tumultuous personal life, um, but he didn't leave New York. Instead, he married a Syrian woman from Zahli, and she traveled for him selling his Turkish goods around the country. You find her in Seattle, Washington. You find her in Detroit. You find her all over very early as well. And she was apparently his, I don't know if this is the right term, his beard, because she was arrested for smuggling several times, smuggling goods, trying not to pay duty and taxes on the goods. She never spent time in jail because it was always just a matter of settling financially, paying the duties and paying her lawyers and getting out. He never got arrested. Only she did. Okay, next please. We know, I'm, I'm doing this in chronological order, so um, we know this is the two of the members of the first Syrian immigrant family, the Arbili. Joseph, the father, is on the right, and Abraham, the oldest son, is on the left. Abraham was a doctor. He, has a, he had a degree from um, what was then Syrian Protestant College. It's now AUB. Um, one of the earliest doctors to come out of the school, and also a degree from Constantinople, so he was doubly qualified. Um, and he was practicing medicine in Los Angeles uh, very early. And um, in, in 1885, he, saw, he showed antiquities at um, the California State Fair. And the only reason we know about it is because he won a prize for the quality of the goods, which he later sold to the Smithsonian as well. It just brings up the idea that we don't yet know how many Syrians participated in this, these smaller state fairs, which went on everywhere, in every state, every year. And we don't know how many Syrians participated because the documentation for them is quite poor. Okay. So several members of the Arbili family were living in Atlanta when the first three seasons of the Piedmont Exposition, and this is the first season, and this is the building that they built. I mean, these fair uh, constructions were incredibly ornate and huge. Um, there were three seasons in 1887, 1889, and 1890, and, uh, and I, we know that they went to at least the first season, the Arbelis. We don't know about the other seasons. And we don't know whether there were Syrian participations in those first three. But in 1891, standing out among the very drab exhibits of agricultural machinery, cotton picking machinery, and, and dry goods, was um, Ibrahim Wakad, the a merchant from Damascus, who was showing dazzling Turkish embroideries and oriental luxuries, as well as a model of, and I have to say this in the way it was said in the paper, a Mahomet mosque. So he made a Muslim mosque, or someone built one, and he brought it with him. And he wore, quote, unquote, the rich garb of the Bedouin of the desert and was by no means the least attractive feature of the exhibit. So you can see, you know, the, these Syrians, they knew how to sell goods. He was an Orthodox Christian from Damascus and related to the Arbili family. 
So Nassim Arbili, the youngest son, was his assistant in the, in the Piedmont Fair. Um, Moak had went on to make a name for himself in, on paper only because he told everyone that he was going to build a replica of the street called Straight. I don't know, it's a, you know, it's a biblical something. I'm not sure. It's some, something in the Bible at the Columbian Fair. He never did it, but he was in all the newspapers all over the country because this was such an amazing idea, they thought. So that brings us to the Columbia Fair. Next, please. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you a lot. There's a lot about the Columbian Fair in my book. There's a lot on my blog. People know about it. I just want to show you pictures and kind of give you the, the highlights for the Syrians. Um, the themes of technological progress, education, patriotism, so trumpeted in earlier fairs, took a back seat, finally took a back seat at the Columbian Fair to the Midway Plaisance, and you can see the mile-long uh, Midway Plaisance is running per perpendicular to the fair. But this Midway Plaisance was peopled by American hucksters, Egyptian belly dancers, Japanese samurai, Dahomeyan tribesmen, and Austrian dairy maids, to name only a few. The 27 million attendees to the Columbian Fair, had to walk through the Midway Plaisance to get to what was called the White City because many of the buildings were uh, white. And the White City, which is this thing along Lake Michigan, was all the educational and country exhibits and state exhibits. Well, many people walked through the Midway Plaisance and never made it to the White City. No, not very many people were interested in the education. They wanted to have the fun. Go, next slide, please. The Middle East dominated the Midway Plaisance by far. They were the, um, the, the largest number of people, the largest number of concessions. And this was the most important part of the fair for, in terms of the Middle East, which was the street of Cairo. Um, this is a, and by the way, the Ferris wheel made its debut at the Columbian Fair. And there it is, it was right next to a mosque, a replica of a mosque. And this is an actual photograph of the street of Cairo. You can see there's a man who's dressed in a bear suit. You can see people on camels, every, people dressed up. Yeah, so, this is, so they built a, a full-scale but kind of cheap replica of a street in Cairo. In addition, uh, there was a, a Turkish village, uh, Moroccan, Tunisian, and Algerian installations, a Persian palace, and the Turkish building inside the fair proper, which was the only Middle Eastern installation inside the White City. Yes. And this is another one of my favorites. Each of the con concessions, each of the Middle Eastern concessions had a Middle Eastern manager. And these are the three most important ones. So this is George Pangalo on the left. He's a, a Greek from Smyrna who was living in Alexandria. A Joseph Usani, a Chaldean from Iraq and who um, Akram has his diary when he was traveling to the Colombian Fair, actually he went by horse from Baghdad to Marseille with 40 trunks of goods and 12, 12 um, Iranians, because he was in charge of the Perla, per Persian palace. And Robert Levy, who was born in Constantinople, but had immigrated to the United States many years before, but look at the way he's dressed for the fair. Okay. Um, the hundreds and hundreds of people, Syrians and other Middle Easterners, came to the Colombian Fair. These are just two sheets of multi-sheet ship, ship manifests, which landed two weeks apart in New York City. Every single person on each of these sheets is going to the fair. And I don't know if you can read it from here, but a lot of them say artiste, performer, servant, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And it, there were 230 that came on the Gilt Hall, 200 that came on the Cynthiana. But in addition to those, hundreds came on their own, got onto ships and came. H.H. H. Jessup, the Presbyterian minister, uh, in, in a missionary in Beirut, laments the number of people who are leaving for the Colombian fair, this kind of fair fever that he sees. All, all of the Protestants that he's trained are all leaving for the fair. Okay, so next, yeah. Um, so they were required by the terms of the contract with the exposition committee 
to live on the grounds, the fairgrounds, wear native costume, and work in the concession of the country from which they came. And only the Syrians broke all of those rules because the Syrians were completely transnational. And I think the reason that they were able to do that is because I think the fair managers didn't really know what Syrians were, didn't really know who was a native of what country. And so they just, um, so, um, so they worked in the Egyptian, the Ottoman, the Tunisian, and the Persian sections. They appear in fair photographs, costumes as, costumed as Europeanized, Europeanized Turks, Asiatic Turks, Bedouins, Persians, belly dancers, sheikhs, and it goes on and on. And these are just some of the Middle Easterners. And you see, you know, you, if you get to know these guys and women, you can see them in photograph after photograph after photograph. All in, you know, these are all studio photographs, all in the same studio, all with different clothes, all described differently, usually with a different name as well. Okay, next, please. So we know that 26 Syrian merchants, many of whom had formed temporary companies to come to the fair, sold goods in the Turkish section, and eight companies sold goods in the Turkish section, which may or may not have been owned by Syrians. They, they didn't, uh, it's not clear. Three Syrian merchants had booths in Cairo Street, and three more were selling in the Tunisian section. And this is a Damascus merchant's house that's in the Turkish village on the Midway Plaisance. And even, I mean, I thought for a long time when I looked at this that these were mannequins, but they're, they're actually people. Okay, and next... And this is one of the great pictures. This is the Sadullah, Suhami Sadullah Company, a Syrian from Constantinople. They were actually, he was actually an investor in the um, Turkish uh, concession, selling goods. So this is a mannequin, and this is a real person. And you see her everywhere. And this old guy was in the previous picture as an old sheikh. Yeah, okay. Next, please. And this is uh, the Usani, who owned the Persian palace but also sold goods. And believe it or not, some of their trinkets still exist uh, in the home of, their great, of his great, not his, but the Usani great-granddaughter. And uh, they sold, as well as running the Persian palace, they, um, they sold tobacco. And this is a little, the package is later, but the photograph of Yak Usani was taken at the fair. Yeah. And Abraham Samaha, John Abdel Noor, and Fadis Ferzan, the three of the four from the earlier fairs, were all there. And this is um, Abraham Samaha's uh, booth in front of the Persian palace. And you'll see that uh, they've already started showing Oriental dancing girls in the Persian palace. So they've, they're beginning to decide that they have to compete with the Egyptian and Syrian belly dancers. So Osani um, brought dancers from Paris and dressed them up in Oriental clothes, and they danced the can-can. Okay. So a full year before the Colombian fair, Najib Malouf uh, was writing from Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, had written a long letter to the newspaper Kaukab America, warning readers of the heavy expenses that they would incur in setting up a booth at the Colombian fair, but few people paid attention but he was right to warn them. When the fair closed in November, many merchants, blaming a variety of the bad actors and circumstances beyond their control, came away disappointed, if not in debt. There were even stories of some suicides. Kaukab's list of the merchants who had actually made a profit was very short. The most spectacular success was the street of Cairo, thanks to the belly dancers who some said saved the entire fair from bankruptcy. The street of Cairo was the largest contributor, contributor to the fair coffers of any other concession. They contributed $185,000 to the fair coffers, and that was larger than any other concession, bar none. And the most spectacular failure was the Turkish village owned by the Sultan and by three Syrian investors. The company ended in debt, and many of its employees were stranded in Chicago. And there was, there's a great quote from a newspaper. The city is now said to be full of thieves and robbers, and hundreds of foreigners 
Turks, Arabs, Syrians, Persians, and Eskimo, who made the Midway so lively during the fair, are still there peddling their wares and unable to get away. Chicago is now paying for her fun. Yeah. 28 firms that won prizes in Chicago participated in New York's month-long World's Fair Prize Winners Exposition, which opened in the new 300,000-square-foot Grand Central Palace on December 1, 1893. It was on 43rd in Lexington, for those of you who know New York. They were selling Turkish goods. All of them were selling Turkish goods, except for Naum Gabgab, who became a traveling minister, and he was showing panoramic photographs of the Holy Land. The prize winners fair or, um, added an Egyptian theater so they could bring the belly dancers from Chicago because they needed to boost their income. But even with that, the Syrians wrote a letter to the mayor of New York begging him to help them bring in visitors because they were losing money. It was not a success. Next. When the Scions of San Francisco decided it was time to boost their city, they planned the California Midwinter International Exposition. It opened in Golden Gate Park on January 27, 1894, only about three weeks after the uh, prize winners' fair in New York closed. So people really had to hustle to get their stuff together and get out there. Um, next, please. The managers had invited those attractions and merchants at the Chicago Fair to replicate their successes. And that meant, of course, the Middle Easterners came. So next, please. Cairo Street. By the way, the, the, name, of the, um, concession, the name of the attraction at the Chicago Fair was the Streets of Cairo. And it became known as Cairo Street. And everyone called it Cairo Street because, and everyone knew about it. So it became shorthand. So every other um, concession that was built was called Cairo Street. So Cairo Street, with its belly dancers and Turkish cafe, was a show in. This is the Turkish theater. And if you look closely at the faces, you will know immediately that at least half the performers were Americans. Uh, and so you can see that already the Arab um, performances were being co-opted by Americans. And part of the reason is that a lot of the people had gone home after the Chicago Fair, so there were no longer enough people to uh, staff a theater. Next, please. And this is one of my favorite photographs of the Midwinter Fair. This is the Turkish cafe, the Cairo Cafe. And they're, you know, they're obviously uh, Syrian and Ottoman men sitting, playing backgammon, smoking nargile. And when I looked at it and looked at it again, I realized that they're performing. You see the plate glass window? You see the people peeking in? So they have this plate glass window separating them. So the two women on the left, they're, they're Middle Easterners, but the man on the right in his derby hat is watching them do these things, watching them play backgammon, smoke nargile, drink tea, whatever they're doing inside. And they are, you know, they're in their clothes, and they, they are performance, performers. Only a month into the midwinter fair, Kaukab Mamrika reported that the Syrian merchants were being undercut by the cheaper prices of Japanese and Chinese silk. And they hadn't had to um, compete with so much Japanese and Chinese stuff, but this was on the West Coast, right? And worse, the managers of the Oriental Village imposed an extra admission price, cutting down on foot traffic, which led to fistfights in the Oriental Village until the Syrian merchants threw the ticket takers physically out. The police came, they closed down all of the booths, and that was a, you know, that was a zero-sum game because then no one was making any money. They finally reopened, um, but did very badly, and they were um, very disappointed. The only saving grace was that um, 15 firms won medals, won award for the quality of their goods, and so that gave them bragging rights. Following on the heels of the Midwinter Fair came the Northwest Interstate Fair in Tacoma, Washington. It opened between August 15th and November 1st, 1894. The organizers had gone to San Francisco and contracted directly with the concessionaires 
at the Midwinter Fair to bring the leading attractions to Tacoma. And this time, at this fair for the first time, um, a Syrian, Rashid Jedasati, remember the Jedasati brothers booth at the um, Atlantic um, City? Rashid Jedasati took the concession for the entire Oriental village, which meant that he had to rent out the booths to other Syrians and other Middle Easterners to bring goods, but he was on the hook for the whole um, concession. And in, wor in, in fair language, a concession is called a privilege. So you get this language all the time of, of taking on a privilege. Um, once again, the Turkish village at the Tacoma Fair was anchored by, the, by Cairo Street, which included a theater with, quote, four genuine Turkish dancing girls sword fighters, fortune tellers, bazaars, camels, Nubian camel drivers, Egyptian bakers, and, quote, other features of a street in old Cairo. The innovations of the Chicago Fair had hardened into a formula. And Michael, and the only, we only know that, two, besides Rashid Jadassati, we only know names of two Syrians who were there, Michael and Gabriel Jassus, because Michael Jassus fell in love with a Tacoma heiress and married her. And she was killed tragically on their honeymoon. He was accused of her murdering her for her money, was never charged because it was completely untrue. But it's the only part of the fair that got publicity. There was a noticeable lack of enthusiasm in the newspaper accounts. Nobody talked about it. The public was lukewarm. They halved the admission price to try to get more people in. It did not work. It closed in November. Nobody even noticed when it closed. And although we don't know for sure, we imagine that the Syrians were, went away disappointed. The Cotton States and International Exposition to be held in Atlanta's Piedmont Park in 1895 presented another opportunity to a Syrian, this time to Najib Barbili, who was the editor of Kalkab Amrika, who took on the privilege for the Turkish village, the oriental section of the fair. He leased out space to companies or individual merchants for an Arabic restaurant, a coffee room, a Bedouin show, camel and donkey rides, yada, 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 all the same things, and promised a theater for oriental dancing. Um, he admitted that the midwinter fair in California had not been a success, but he hoped this one would be better. Uh, he advertised for a Bedouin tent with all the accessories and five trained camels that he could take to this fair. Uh, he and George Pangalo, who had run the Street of Cairo in, at the Columbia Fair, got the concession for the Street of Cairo at the Atlanta Fair. We know the names of five Syrians at the fair because they were involved in a brawl and all got arrested and were fined. Um, and one was, next slide please, one was called Sayed Holy Moses. So the Americans had named one of the camels at the Colombian fair Holy Moses. And I think it's because when Americans got on, you know, they'd be so frightened when the camel got up and they'd say Holy Moses, so they named a camel. So now that we have a man, a Syrian man named Sayed Holy Moses. And reportedly, and this is something I'm going to write about someday, he knew three words in English. And when, so when a child would get on a camel, he could say those three words, which are lean way back. And he'd say lean way back. Because you can imagine, right, the rear legs go up first. And you have to lean way back to stay in the saddle. And the other thing he knew were all the verses to this song, which had just come out and was a big hit in the United States. And he would sing it to the children on the camels as they rode around. I mean, I think it's just so great. Um, 100 Algerians, Nubians, and Moors took part in this fair. And Syrian merchants shared space with the usual belly dancers. But this time around, Baelish and Jaha won the only prize. And I don't know whether it was because Syrian goods and Turkish fancy goods were already going out of fashion or because um, the, the quality of goods were deteriorating because they, they, were, they were no longer importing them. Okay, so several more, several more major fairs occurred after Atlanta, including the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition in Omaha in 1898, with its Street of All Nations. 
the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901 with its 100 Orientals, and the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis in 1904 with its Old Cairo Street and its spectacular, believe this or not, full-scale replica of Jerusalem, for which they imported 1,000 people to, to live, in, live in Jerusalem, take the people on camel rides, sell their goods, and uh, Syrians participated in all three of these fairs. Between 1876 and 1904, Syrians sold goods at at least 18 fairs, and probably many more we don't know about, at least not yet. But why? Why did they keep going back time and again after so many of their efforts seemed to lead, if not to losses, then at least to only modest returns? We know from their later careers that none of these men were stupid or naive. In fact, just the opposite. So what did fair participation do for them? Fairs presented an opportunity to satisfy the Orientalist fantasies of the American public on a large scale. And as we have seen, every sale involved performance. Whether it meant dressing in native costume, beguiling the customer with stories about the exotic East, or telling made-up stories about the goods themselves. That continued to be true even if you had a shop on Main Street, USA. Syrians learned to sell to Americans and learned to sell hard. There are as many accounts of Syrians fleecing Americans as there are of Americans fleecing the innocent foreigners. The concentrated quality of the fairs taught them quickly what sold and what didn't. And what I find most interesting is that these fair-going merchants became a model for all Turkish goods salesmen, all Syrian and Armenian, really, Turkish goods salesmen who moved around the country constantly, changing venues as soon as their market was saturated. Their pop-up shops or temporary booths were ubiquitous until Turkish goods went out of vogue. Permanent Syrian and Armenian rug stores which began to open in the first decade of the 20th century, were and are the only survivors of this flourishing itinerant trade in Turkish fancy goods. And finally, for the Syrians, having to deal with thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of Americans every day, was a crash course in American culture. Conversely, the fairs introduced 50 million Americans to goods and peoples people they had never seen before. At the Centennial Fair in 1876, Bayer Taylor, who's a very famous travel writer, had written about the visitor's first glimpse of Japanese, Turks, Greeks, or Moors. He said, the agreeable surprise, in most cases, as if the spectator had found an unexpected likeness to his own stock and recognized, if unconsciously to himself, that the ends of the earth are not so very far apart after all. As Pollyannish as this might sound from the 21st century and in hindsight, it is true that this exposure not only expanded the American market for exotic goods, but also expanded the American mind, making it easier to accept these exotic strangers. More than one story about Syrian, a Syrian merchant settling in an out-of-the-way town in wherever, Wyoming, would include the statement, he won a silver medal at the World's Fair, which instantly placed him in a context that everyone could understand. Such a recommendation did not make him less other. In fact, it might have made him more exotic in some people's eyes. But it did establish his bona fides in the town, in general, the acceptance and assimilation of Syrian immigrants in the United States in the 19th century must be reckoned a success. The 20th century is another story, and this success can be attributed, at least in part, to their frequent and persistent, one might say stubborn, participation in America's fairs. Thank you. A mess. Okay. Thank you so much, Linda. 
Uh, we'll take questions, and as I said earlier, if you could speak out loud, I will try to repeat your question, and then uh, Linda will answer it. So we have about uh, half an hour, so the floor is open. Or we can all eat cookies. Someone be first. Oh, good. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the, the notion of be, uh, uh, international exposition of fair being three things. One, part show. Second, for trade. And the other, for uh, the showing off of technology or something new. Um, I'm interested in kind of the, the first part, which you kind of mentioned at the last part of your presentation. This idea of the exotic. And this be, idea, sorry, being what? Um, I'm interested in the third part that you were mentioning at the last last part of your presentation, the idea of the exotic, yes, and the idea of um, this last half of the 19th century being this notion of the grand voyage of rich Americans going over to see, for example, the Holy Lands. Right. Um, how much of these fairs were buying into maybe some of the stereotypes uh, for people that visited the fair that never had the chance? to go over and see kind of the real, or what was imagined as the real. That's, that's exactly, exactly what, oh, do you want to repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's quite right. Sorry, go ahead. So the question for the record is basically this whole idea of exoticism and othering and how Americans imagined the world and how much of a role this performance, these performances played in emphasizing and uh, changing or whatever Americans imaginary of the other. Um, you know, it's it had the two things, right? It, the exotic and the the sanctified, the holy side. So the the and they mesh in the Middle East where they don't mesh in China or Japan. So there was Orientalist craze for Chinese goods, you know, chinoiserie, and for Japanese goods as well. But for the for the Middle Easterners, there was this there was this conjunction with the Holy Land as well. Um, wh what I you know and it, what I find so fascinating is that the Syrians understood from the very beginning what that meshing meant and took advantage in every way that they could. So in the 1876 fair saying that this wood comes from the places that are dear to the hearts of Christians, knowing to say that in the very first time that they appeared at one of these fairs. So yeah, definitely. And the fact that you know, 50 million people came to the fairs and only the wealthy could go on a trip, but 50 million people. And so the, the idea of Orientalism had been an upper class preoccupation. All of these mansions on Fifth Avenue in New York had Turkish smoking rooms um, earlier than the Columbian Fair. But now everyone could indulge. So the cigarette package you saw you know, that's cigarettes. Everyone was buying cigarettes. They were now buying Turkish tobacco cigarettes. And there's this exotic guy dressed up on the front with the um, sultan or whoever it was, some, some guy in his fez on, on the other side. So, yeah, it was just a, a democratization of this Orientalist phase, but it went out of style quite quickly because by the first decade of the 20th century, nobody was selling Turkish goods anymore. Nobody. It was gone. Yeah. John? Uh, this past summer I was in Lyon, uh, France, for a short time. And in north of the city, uh, there are, are the remnants, it's now a botanical park, of a, eight, I believe it was 1896 World's Fair, uh, of, of which a, a, a substantial portion was devoted to uh, Indochina. But I'm sure there were many other representations. And where, what city? Lyon. Oh, Lyon. Okay, okay. Right. Uh-huh. Um, in, so, so my question is, with Syrians in America going from uh, exposition to exposition, uh, there were certainly gaps. Were these, were, were the same people ever involved just go over to France and do an exposition there or to England or to somewhere else? Ah, uh, okay, so... Go ahead. So the question is about is the the question is about the journeys of these performers in America's fairs and whether they actually went beyond the boundaries of the United States to places like France, Lyon, where they perform the same thing but in a different environment. So right after the Colombian fair, the Antwerp fair opened, and the Kalkab gives you a list of the Syrians who went to the Antwerp fair, but no information about what happened 
to them there. One would have to go to Antwerp and look at the records and, and see what happened because they weren't reported on. One was my, my great uncle who went to the Antwerp fair to show, to show uh, silk goods again. Yeah. They didn't, um, you know, there, there were Syrians that came from Syria to go to these um, European fairs and then would go back to Syria. But the American Syrian merchants, that, the Antwerp fair is the only one I know about that, where they went out of the country, yeah. But the Arbelis went to the, the, the Exposition Universelle in 1878. And then the, the street of Cairo um, at the Colombian Fair was modeled almost exactly on the Rue du Caire of the 1889 Exposition in Paris. And George Pangalo, who was the organizer, had um, spent a lot of time at the, he wasn't in charge, but spent a lot of time at the French fair to get ideas. Oh, before the next question, I actually want to just do some clarifications because Linda is using a term and the title of the talk is another term. So we have Syrians, Arabs, ah. Middle Easterners, Lebanese. Ah. So yeah. I just want to clarify for those of you who may not be familiar with this. Uh, so we use the term Syria not in the modern national sense of where Syria is, but rather in the notion of a greater Syria, which was a province of the Ottoman Empire that includes today's Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Israel. And these are the sort of the, the main area for where you see the early Arabic speakers immigrants. So we see a lot of, we use the term Arab not because they ever identified as Arab, they wouldn't because the term Arab was used for Bedouins usually. But in essence, they use it as a way of identifying, you know, we use it as a way of what they spoke the language. So there's a lot of fluidity to all of these things. And the majority of the people who come here from greater Syria tend to come from what we know today as Lebanon. So this is kind of a roundabout way of kind of exploring the complexity of these ethnicities. Anyway, Thank I just you. wanted to clarify that Thanks, good. in case we really got all confused. So we got Will and then Noah. Well, let's follow that idea of this fluidity because part of the exotic would be being Muslim from Turkey or someplace and then part of their cleverness was we're all Orthodox Christians so how often did we have Christians portraying Muslims at the fair and Muslims pretending to be Christians for the Holy Land market? Can I answer that or you have to uh, repeat I'll the repeat question? I'll repeat it. <laughs> That's a it's great my question. favorite So thing. the question is about this fluidity of representation and what Will is asking is how often do we have people who are really, uh, in terms of their religion, uh, a Christian pretending to be Muslims and vice versa, this kind of cross, just in order to sort of, you know, perform and to make money, obviously. So I wrote a blog, which you, or, and well, there's also on your, on, in your journal called Playing East. Uh, so the Syrian Christians were experts at being Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. So they went around um, and performed on stages, on vaudeville stages, in church halls, in community halls. They dressed up like, either like Bedouins or like Muslims, whatever that meant to whoever they were performing for. Either charged admission and did the Mohammedan call to prayer, um, or the, you know, a, a, what they, they said Muslim, a Muslim wedding, or um, sword fighting, or any of the things that, they, that people in America think that Muslims do. I don't know why they think that, but, you know, sword fighting is probably not their no daily task. And they would either charge admission or they would sell goods at the end of their lecture. And so it had, and, and uh, it's, it's all of a piece, you know, all of this, enter, this lecturing, there's this like spectrum of entertainment for the Syrians. So it starts out with the, um, let's see, the most popular, which is the belly dancing and the vaudeville performances. And it goes to these, these fair performances because this, the Turkish village, for example, they had um, horse races, they had sword fights, they had, I showed you a lemonade cellar. They had um, uh, how does, you know, those things that fit on top of camels where people could ride inside the thing. The, you know, they had a lot of this kind of manly display of what people considered to be Arab. And um, we, don't, we don't know how many, because the names on the ship manifests are very um, difficult to understand, but um, probably a majority of the people who came were Christians. Not all. For sure, not all, but a majority. Um, so there's that. And then there's the 
uh, entertainers who went around, entertainer, I call them entertainers slash lecturers, who went around the country dressing up, charging admission, or selling goods, and performing these acts. The Arbeelys started it, the first Syrian immigrant family started it in 1881. Um, they would dress up. I have lots of pictures of them dressed in these clothes, you know, like a shake or like a, sometimes in women's clothes as well, um, pr pretending to be a Muslim family, you know, and somebody, and the person who's dressed up as a woman is embroidering on the, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then there's the next level, which is the kind of more refined uh, lecture which is maybe you dress up in something, but you don't perform. You, t you give a lecture about the Holy Land, or you give a lecture about the um, you know, Syrians or uh, the Muslim world or whatever. And then the, the top would be the religious lectures. So those lectures that had been done by American missionaries are now being done by Syrians. Um, and they're, they're always in the same sort of guys, we're raising, uh, the reason that we're asking you to give a donation is because we're raising money to, to convert our fellow Syrians. But, you know, they, could, they, didn't, they never converted anyone to anything, really. But they, uh, it was a way of making a living. So there's this whole spectrum, and the fairs are kind of in the middle. Uh, I'll get to your question in a second, Noah, but there's also, so between the notion of Christians and Muslims, there's another community that we rarely ever talk about, the Druze community, and in fact, yeah. the Druze, which is a heterodox sect of Islam, were a fairly significant uh, percentage of the early immigrants. We have a very hard time distinguishing, uh, Linda and I had a long conversation about this, about the percentages, and there's all sorts of arguments, how many were Catholic, how many were Greek Orthodox, the names really don't tell the story, so there's probably a higher percentage of Druze and Muslims than we actually ever account for, and so we really cannot tell that. And the second part is about performances, because many of you eat at Jasmine's, uh, which is called Lebanese and Mediterranean cuisine. The owners are Palestinian. The workers are from North Africa. And they never would call themselves Palestinian uh, because obviously that immediately evokes a different images. And, and when, what is this? Uh, this is Jasmine's. It's right across the street. It's a very popular shawarma place. Ah, okay, okay. And then if you go downtown, there's a place called Sitia Restaurant, which is authentic Lebanese, and all the cooks are Mexican. Uh, so, I mean, right... <laughs> I think, I think this whole notion of performances is, is it just goes on. So anyway, Noah, your good, question. Very please. good. So I would like to kind of think about the connection between um, this this uh, phenomen phenomenon of the, of the fairs to um, kind of the American context, and especially in the context of race. This is Reconstruction era, right? This is post Civil War with this with these, uh, this investment in whiteness, right? Um, either, I mean, whether we're talking about like the South or we're talking about the so-called frontier. And I'm, ju I'm just wondering how these, um, especially those who migrated, who stayed, how are the, you know, Syrian um, um, merchants? Seen, seen. Seen, accepted, how are they, like, how did they, fit into this, this kind of uh, new uh, sort of reconceptualized idea of whiteness and race. Yeah. So the question is about how do these immigrants, uh, whether they are temporary coming to the fairs or the more permanent ones, uh, on the sort of racialized landscape in post-Civil War and Reconstruction era United States, where do they fit on this you know, spectrum of whiteness? How are they seen from outside beyond exotic? Uh, are they seen as white, as non-white, and so on and so forth? Yeah, so there's a terrific book about it by this woman named Sarah Gualtieri. So she's the expert, and I'm not the expert. I can only tell you what I, I see, which is they were white until they weren't white anymore. They, um, ever, no one, occasionally you would get someone saying they're swarthy. That, that would be the closest they would come to a racial comment. Um, in the early days, so in the 19th century, nobody, and, and as you know, I'm sure, on the census data, they're invariably called white. In all of the census data I've looked at, there is one person of the 14,000 that I've looked at so far who's denoted as black. Now, they often lived in African-American neighborhoods because those were where poor people lived, and they were poor, but they were not seen 
as brown. They were not seen as black. They were seen as white. Then in the 20th century, that changed when um, there, it became incumbent on people who wanted to become citizens that they be white. And so the Syrians had to prove that they were white. And that, um, it's in Gualtieri. There are a series of cases, um, and everyone was decided differently because the judge would look at somebody, and if they had light skin, sometimes they'd say, oh, yes, you're white, you can be a citizen. If they had dark skin, they'd say, no, you're not white, you can't be a citizen. And um, sometimes they do it on the basis, and this is, what the, and this is what the Syrians themselves would say, we are Semites. Jesus was a Semite. How could Jesus be black? Right? Yeah, it's very, very, very racialized and very... Weird, but that's what they felt was the best way for them to defend their right to be citizens. And sometimes that worked, and sometimes it didn't work. So, um, but I really, I mean, I may be a Pollyanna about this, and I perfectly admit that it's possible because I'm in love with this research and I'm in love with all these 19th century people, but I really sincerely believe that the acceptance of Syrians in the 19th century context was really quite um, amazing and wonderful for the exotic. I mean, you look at the Arbili in this small town in Tennessee. They'd never seen a Syrian in their lives before. And they, were, uh, they had friends, true friends, in this town. They, a, a guy defended them in print when someone criticized one of their um, entertainments. Uh, one of their friends def defended them in print. They went with their, uh, some Quakers to the White House together on a long trip to D.C. I mean, they really, and it's true, they spoke English quite well. So that helped. And they were well-educated. That also helped. But it's kind it's of astonishing. I think it's also important to keep in mind that in small communities, you can remain exotic. But when you become a large community, you become a threat. That's so right. Free. And the so. 19th century communities, I mean, even, you know, with, with the, let's say there were 20,000 people in the whole United, Syrians in the whole United States, the communities were small. But, and, even, and in New York, you know, let's say 2,000 people in 1900 compared to the population of New York. Um, but, it, but they weren't ignored. They were noticed. I mean, people did notice them either because they were exotic or because they weren't exotic. And they, there were a lot of articles about them. And nobody, they treated them pretty well. I mean, to, I'm not Pollyanna so much because subsequently to the 1900s, they did. Subsequently it was we bad. see a series of yeah. all sorts of things that begin to blow up. And yeah. there are all sorts of, from U.S. senators, this kind of harkens to today's world, obviously, to local newspapers that are beginning to attack these populations. But what is really interesting about what Linda said in terms of the legal cases and the argument that they made about Jesus being a Semite and therefore, you know, since they're Semites, therefore by extension they're white, which is they're mapping their religion onto a racial space. But the same argument was made in the South African Supreme Court, in the Australian Supreme Court, and in a, in ah. a, in a, yes, and in a district court here in, uh, in uh, South Carolina, actually. I think it was in South Carolina, the Dow case. I think that was in South Carolina. South Carolina. And so all three made the, exactly the same argument uh, and in that regard. And the two lawyers who were defending the Dow case, the South Carolina case, were both Jewish lawyers who were also hired for, you know, I don't know why the Syrian community specifically hired them, but they themselves later on argued that if the Syrians are deemed to be as non-white, then the Jews are going to be next. Right, because of the Semites. So there was that argument that was sort of uh, kind of the Semites banding together at least for five seconds uh, <laughs> before we go on from there. Anyway. Right, right, right. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. So I was just basically going to ask that. Um, I'm, so I'm Greek, and with us and our culture, we basically have kind of watered down our culture to make it more appealing to the American public. Um, and with the Greek festivals and the food and everything, and I was just going to ask if they were doing the same thing, like watering it down, making it seem more appealing and less of a culture shock. So not in the 19th century, but you can answer the 20th century because <laughs> you're the one who goes to city, which is the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, because they, cause they were still selling the exotic okay. in the 19th century. And so they, you know, people would come down to the colony in New York and they would write these articles about this strange food that was being sold in these restaurants. They thought it was, 
fascinating and also hysterical. You know, they thought it was just very funny. The Syrians knew that they were doing that. They knew that. And they wouldn't have changed anything because that's what they wanted. They wanted that kind of attention. And of course, they were eating the food that they wanted to eat as well. Um, but, the, but, you know, there's this, I, there's this great quote in a, in a newspaper, short newspaper filler, of this woman who's selling, um, a peddler, woman peddler who's selling laces in New York. And I guess the reporter said, uh, you know, I don't know what, what are you selling or something, and I can't remember what he asked her, but she said, of course I wear my kerchief. Why would anyone buy from me if I didn't wear my kerchief? So she, too, was saying, I am, I'm selling the exotic. I am selling the exotic, and that is how I make a living, and I'll do, I mean, you know, may, there, I'm sure there were limits, but the, those things they could do, those things they could do. Yeah. And again, I mean, it varies, right? Mm -hmm. So the yeah. landscape, if you look at the south versus the northeast, again, if you have a large community that is sitting in a place like Boston or New York, where Linda has done a lot of her work, I mean, that's a large enough community to maintain an ethnic enclave, right? But even then, if you look at how they dressed, including like Ostwin, uh, the, the priest, I mean, if you look at his photograph, he was photographed for like, he's a Maronite priest in Brooklyn, first in New York uh, and then Brooklyn. Uh, the dress becomes very quickly changed into what's considered, you know, Western dress. And in fact, you know, that happens in Marseille on the way here. Because if you look at pictures of them when they arrive in southern France on the way here, they dress in what would be village clothes, I guess. And then by the time they get to New York, they've kind of changed a little bit of how they're dressed. So there is a transformation. But they remain privately very Syrian, I mean, to use that term. But publicly, there is an adjustment at some point that they have to make, obviously. Tommy. Other scholars on the consumer and leisure economy, like Kristen Haas, uh, you know, and, uh, and Christopher Eddy, of uh, Kristen Haas who studies imports, and Christopher Eddy who studies international travel, um, who make arguments about um, Americans' embrace of Orientalism in the consumer and leisure economy. Again, say that last again. Um, they, um, the embrace. These scholars, they. Uh, they um, say that Americans' embrace of Orientalism and the leisure and consumer economies shape their approach to both immigration policy and foreign policy in later years. Ah. So I, um, I just wondered what you thought was the, the impact on, on uh, broader American cultural, um, maybe, maybe those two issues or some other issues. I just see, see some wow, that. I don't even have an answer to that because I don't know anything about, I, I don't know. Um, well, Arbili, you wrote that article about Arbili that I think... About Arbili. So, um, so one of the Arbili sons uh, was uh, nominated and confirmed as the consul to Jerusalem and, uh, in 1885. And he went to Jerusalem, uh, but already before he went, uh, there was going to be some... He knew there was going to be some trouble. And the trouble took the form of the Ottoman government not wanting to um, approve him. Because for the Ottoman, uh, you, were not, you could not give up your Ottoman citizenship unless the sultan or someone gave you express permission to give up your Ottoman citizenship. So therefore, he, even though he was naturalized in the United States, therefore he was still an Ottoman citizen and could not represent the United States in the Ottoman Empire, so they refused him. But in the process of the refusal, um, the, the Secretary of State and the envoy in Constantinople had a long exchange of letters about uh, whether they should uh, accept the Ottoman um, decision or not without a fight. And it seems to me, um, to have come down in a way to the idea that um, Arbili, and I think it, to his eternal regret, I think that they remembered his presentation of himself as exotic. And I think they decided that he was not American, in fact, and that they would not fight for him. 
So, I mean, that's not really answering your question because I don't really know. Um, do you have any insight into that? I don't really know how this kind of, this idea of Orientalism, I'm, um, you know, the, 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 the guy who, whose place he was supposed to take in, in um, Jerusalem was kind of this standard anti-Semite, anti-Muslim, Christian, can I say creep? <laughs> he seemed like a creep, you know. Um, very, you know, a, a, a minister and an archaeologist and a um, really a racist guy. And, though, and maybe he was representative of the kinds of people that they sent to the Holy Land. I don't know. Do you know? I have no idea. Well, I mean, I think, uh, I honestly don't know the connection between the fairs and what happens later on in terms of how either American public or the American foreign uh, decision makers really saw the Orient, so to speak, as they imagine the Middle East. So I really don't know that direct relation because I haven't looked at it. But there is no doubt, and there's a great book by Melanie McMaster called Epic Encounters yeah. that looks at that sweep, long sweep of history. I mean, she focuses on the 40s and to the 70s, but even before that, in which this idea of what the Middle East is, which in many ways is inherited from European Orientalism, plays out in American Orientalism. Uh, I think the fair perhaps exoticizes it, but it certainly doesn't, uh, make them less uncivilized uh, or less barbaric and less different enough that they would see th them as equals by any means. Now, the, the relationship between the fairs and then what happens later on is a bit difficult for me to sort of draw because I really honestly don't know. But well, McMaster's a good example because she starts with film, right, which is mass culture that is building on some of the right. mass culture practices there. Which film is that? The, the, Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and by the way, I mean, just to follow up on the fair, I mean, the next job after the fair, although the fair dies out, Hollywood picks up. And in many ways, Hollywood is, of course, continuing the fair tradition of the exotic. And many of these guys, some of these guys, I don't know if they're the same people, but they actually go on to act as, you know, stock characters within the early film, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know about the same people. Not necessarily. But certainly the, the Middle Easterners, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there's, in fact, a sort of a very interesting uh, composer, music composer, who composes what is supposed to be a Middle Eastern music. He actually is a pianist. His name is Malouf. And uh, he, he goes on to create this, what you can imagine, the World Fair equivalent of music. I mean, you can see the kind of flight as the music goes, this completely fantastical domes and things rising up just to evoke this thing. And, of course, in the 40s and 50s, the films that you're talking about, the B films. Well, you know that tune, uh, maybe you're too young, but when we were young, we would sing it. You know that tune? Da, 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 da. You know that tune? So that was uh, written for the Columbia Fair. And it was written by this guy named Saul Bloom, although that's, in, uh, that's a little bit in dispute, but so let's just say he wrote it. Um, and it became associated with the belly dancers. Well, they never danced to that music, ever. But um, they, th that that minor key or whatever it was became associated with belly dancing. And so whenever, you he whenever I hear it, that's what I, th well, I think of. You do a lot of sword fighting at home. Yeah, exactly. I know we're getting close to the end. To, to kind of respond a little bit to that, and this is total hypothetical positing, and is related to a question I had for Dr. Jacobs, um, I would be curious if the impact of the fair might have been commercial on an international level because um, I've read a lot about the Syrians strongly self-identifying as Venetians, as traders, of really playing up that identity. Um, and then I know as well a lot of the writings by Syrians for Syrians um, followed very closely international trade finances in one book um, that is a uh, part travel guide, part like how to for the new immigrant, um, Dr. Abdu's travels in America. Yeah. Um, in the middle of this like business directory, he has a whole section on like every law related to import and export. Um, and I would be curious because um, a lot of these elites were a lot um, self-advocated very loudly and often were importers for exports if they might have um, had some impact on that level. And I would maybe say that's a direct um, 
connection to the fair. And, but that's all hypothetical. So, so would you repeat uh, that for my benefit? Because, um, Claire, no. you were turning away, so I couldn't really hear. Could you repeat that? No. A bit? <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can tell you later, okay. but I had a question about yes. kind of that yes. commerce um, and mobility when it comes to the attendees of the fair. Um, I don't know if you can answer this or if anyone really can, but kind of compare compared to other um, exoticized groups at the fair, um, did the Syrians have more um, agency or mobility um, or like self-determination um, as a result? So it depended on who you were of the yeah. Syrians, right? There were merchants, there were concessionaires, and there were workers. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you know, that's kind of self-evident. That was true of all the concessions. It was true of the Japanese concession, the Chinese concession. There was a concessionaire. Um, in, in the case of those three managers, they didn't own the concessions because they were, fun they were financed by other people, but they were in charge on the ground. And so they had agency. And um, the merchants had some agency, but as you saw from what I was telling you about throwing the ticket takers out, there was a big controversy at the Columbia Fair about whether to close the fair on Sunday. It had gone on before the fair started, and then, um, it, had, and then it was still being debated while the fair was on, and they tried to close the fair down on Sunday for Christian reasons. People went crazy. And the Syrians went craziest of all, and the Egyptian and the street of Cairo, because it cut down, because that was their big money-making day, right? Yeah, they went, they went crazy, and they reopened. Then they tried to close the belly dancing on Sunday, because it was, right? Because it was um, indecent. And then the, the um, income of the fair halved in one day when they closed the belly dancing on one day, and they quickly reopened. So um, it really depended on who you were. So there were all these people, for example, in the Hamadi company, the Turkish village, who were stuck in Chicago. And the, uh, this is sort of um, weird, and I don't know much about it, um, but the American government started a fund to return people to the Middle East, I mean, to the return people to the countries that they came from, who, uh, whose companies or bosses went bankrupt at the Colombian Fair. And a Syrian was the first one to take advantage. And he went, back, he went to Jerusalem. Yeah. So there were lots of very unagented, you know, people without agency who were there. I mean, just the numbers show that. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank Please you. It's a pleasure.